when I was told before it has changed slightly, but not a huge amount. Um, so password cracking is a, something that I sort of got. I never intended to get into it particularly, but it sort of just happened. And then, um, well, I'll, oh yeah, I'll, I'll explain. Um, so that's my email address on the front page. If anyone has any questions about password cracking, um, do do email me. Um, whatever it is, I'm genuinely quite interested in it, so I don't mind uh, talking to people. Okay. Okay. First off, this. Uh, I've written some code myself, it's essentially a, a Glue script that got a bit out of hand, so it, it all depends on Hashcat, Jenny Ripper, um, Impacket for some of the decodes, um, word lists that other people have compiled, um, and then other libraries and stuff for graphing. Um, and uh, yeah, D D3 and Berkey are very good for graphing if you need to do any graphs on this subject or anything else. Um, so I've written and improved multi-user cracking systems at two UK pen test companies. Um, I guess I've been cracking other people's passwords since about 2003. Um, when I'm blue team, and I put team in quotes because I was the only person, not not because I didn't feel like <laughs> I'm only the team. Um, I used to be a dev, uh, probably not a very good one. Um, sysadmin, uh, and I've been blue team and now I'm a pen tester. Oh, that is not working. Sorry. Um, so, where have I buried? Um, the, the sort of technically, I mean, it's the mathematical and the naive approach gets you quite a long way just from locking and in the same to law or something like that. Th that really does work quite well, especially for NTL and hashes. Um, so that's not too bad, but we, we can do a lot better than that. I mean, there's, I found, uh, say, NCC, there are about four different common hash formats that people wanted to crack. Um, you've got format conversion, so Hashcat doesn't always take what you've got. There are things like, you know, um, Word docs where you need to derive a hash from it. Um, and also, specifically for what I do, checks as we should do this. So just to give you an example of the problem, that's a bunch of hashes. Um, to crack them on Hashcat, you'd need to remember the, the magic dash n number for all of them. Uh, remember roughly how fast they go, so you can choose the appropriate set of rules and dictionary to use. And uh, I just got sick of trying to remember all that stuff. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I wrote some tools, but there's a, it's not just the tool, there's, there's a lot of sort of background which might be useful to you guys if you're ever doing this sort of stuff, or indeed if you're trying to design systems that are relatively robust against this attack. Um, and as I said to someone else, you can, you can make the hashes quite resistant, but obviously the real solution here is to use two-factor or, or a UBQ or something like that. That is really the best thing you can do. Um, uh, so I want to talk about um, why you shouldn't use bad hashes, what the good hashes are that you should be using. Um, I'll talk about the script I've written and, and how it implements the various different things. Um, and I'm going to cover offensive and defensive uses of of cracking hashes because they're, they're both very important. And then two examples I've got are the have there been owned set, which is above phone and million hashes. And um, uh, just for another example, I, I looked at the um, the crack if you can CTF for 2015, which has got about 10 different um, hash types in it. So uh, <coughs> for some purposes, MD5 used to be quite a good hash. Um, in, in some circumstances, you want it to be very quick. Um, it certainly is very quick. Uh, there's since been discovered some cryptographic issues with it. They don't really concern us with 
password cracking, or password hashing at least. Um, what does matter is it's very, very quick to compute. So um, the, the computer I've got at home, which I think I paid about £1,000 for, um, gets 35 billion guesses per second. And obviously, your user is very likely to have a password which is within you know, a couple of minutes of that kind of attack. Um, you can build a lookup table. So you can just compute a bunch of common words and a hash tag. Although, to be honest, at 25 billion guesses a second, the uh, disk I/O is probably worse than just doing it on the CPU. Um, but it's it's essentially a bad hash because it's very very quick to compute. In some applications, that's great. Um, that's not what we want at all. And um, to me, MTM is is MD4, uh, so it's also incredibly quick to compute. And most of you will probably be stuck with that. Um, LM is even worse than that because a uh, uppercase is the value before it hashes it and uh, it splits it into two groups of seven characters. So it makes it very much easier to attack than NT1. Um, so another example of bad hashing I've seen is people who use something like MD5 or SHA1 and just essentially add some secret static data to it before they compute the hash which is uh, fine as long as your secret does stay secret, which it doesn't tend to. Um, you can add a thing called a pepper, which is a per application secret. Um, I've seen other people who compose SHA-1 and MD5. None of these really help strengthen the thing. Um, and really now we've got good library functions to do this. Even in languages like PHP, there's no excuse you know, to, to roll your own. It's, probably not going to work. Um, so an example of a, a much better hash would be um, uh, bcrypt, for example, which is the, the current default in PHP 7. Um, so if you just use a standard library function, put your password to it, it'll give you a sorted hash. So the salt is a random number that goes into it. Um, it's stored along with a hash, but it prevents um, the creation of the lookup table, because essentially it makes, by computing so many random ones, you, you make the lookup table effectively too big to overstore. Um, it also has the cost parameter, so as GPUs and everything get quicker, we can just up the cost parameter um, and it'll, it'll make the computation slower. So essentially, if we can keep the computation of the hash to about, say, 0.1 second, it's not going to annoy the user, um, but it will annoy someone who's trying to do sort of 10 million guesses against it. Um, so essentially, I, I wrote this script uh, to um, take some of the manual work out of this whole process. So it will try to guess the hash type based on regular expressions from what it looks like. Um, if it's something like a doc file, it will invoke a decoder taken from JTR, so we the Ripper, um, so it's got a, a load of very big decoding scripts. Um, and then it'll pick some, based on the speed of the hash, it'll pick some reasonable dictionaries and rules to apply. Um, and you can configure it because all those things are expressed as, as data rather than code. So essentially, what I want when I come across a hash is I want to just kick something off and not really have to think too hard about what I'm doing. Um, because, for, for example, in the last one job I did, we had. Um, two kinds of Oracle hash, um, Linux hash is so sharp, 512 crypt and everything, and I really just want to make sure they're not, you know, really stupid values. Um, so like, like any good coder, I've probably spent more time writing the script than I've saved, um, but what I wanted to do is codify some techniques, um, and then precisely so I can measure if they're actually doing any good, because, you know, we can, you know, everyone has a favourite dictionary or something they want to use. There's probably not very much evidence that it's better than something else. Um, so I wanted to be able to measure it. I want to put common passwords at the front of the process so I can find things quickly. Um, and so I'm I was often stuck in machine room, so I don't have access to anything better or you know, Google or anything like that. Um, so it'll, do, it'll try to Essentially, we've got to look at what Hashcat can do, which is a, it relates to what the graphics card 
is capable of. Um, so there are, there are five main modes. You've got your um, you know, do a dictionary with some rules added. So rules are things like append one, two, three, or you know, change the first letter of the word to a capital. Um, what I call cross product mode, which takes two lists of words and basically it's every combination of the first word being in the first list and the second word being in the second list. Um, and then you've got your mask mode where you can just say, you know, uh, an uppercase for lowercase and a special character. Um, I've put three mask modes because you can also run them with a dictionary and a left and right mask. So that's the constraints about what the underlying thing will do, and that's what we've got to work with. Um, for very fast hashes like NTLM, which I say we, we get billions of guesses per second, you will only get billions of sec guesses per second if you run it with a mask mode or if you supply enough rules, because otherwise you're effectively IO bound and it can't it can't use the full potential of a graphics card. Um, with a slow hash like decrypt, it doesn't matter so much. Um, also, you, you want to make it as efficient as possible, so you want to try commonly use passwords first, um, because especially in red team, we, we want to know passwords as quickly as we can. Um, then you have what is essentially a special case, though it's such a common one. Um, PW dump files. So anything you get from um, you know, dumping hashes off the domain controller or a local machine, you will see, you know, uh, UID, LN hash, NTLM hash. Now, if anyone is still storing LN, and people are, uh, it's incredibly out of date, but some people have compatibility issues. Um, if we can crack the LN password, which is really easy, we have a very good clue as to the NTLM password, because the NTLM is, is going to be the same thing, but possibly with different case, you know, uppercase versus lowercase. Um, so that can help us there as well. So for example, if we have a, um, a dump off a domain controller, um, I did this relatively recently with about 140,000 things. Um, first, it will try to check LM, because LM is, is much simpler. It's uppercase, so you only have really you know, three quarters of the space, you only have uppercase characters, digits, special characters. Um, so you go for that first, and you can, even on this laptop, you will knock out most of the space in an hour or so. Uh, then any answers you get, you can try the case variations on those. So if you've got a, like, an eight character password, there's two to the power of eight possible permutations to try, and that's much quicker than searching the whole space. Um, I wrote this for a relatively quick card, so it will also try by brain kind of running with the default dash A3, which will run through a reasonable character set from sort of one to eight characters. And um, I know your password policy might say you're not allowed to have anything less than eight characters, but you might have things less than eight characters. Um, admins seem to be able to set them if they really, really want to. Um, they may just be stuff that's been marked as password does not expire and dates from sort of 10 years ago or anything like that. Um, a, a fast or a thorough one may also include passwords you've already found. And I had to say the, the best way of guessing passwords is to try passwords you've already found in other things. Um, so it will try all one or two character suffixes and then common three and four character suffixes. And then finally, you do your sort of normal run with a, a decent sized dictionary and some decent rules, um, which the, the thing will choose appropriately so it complete in, say, 12 hours rather than four years. Um, if you're checking bcrypt, that's a very different matter. You can only basically try a very limited set of words, which is typically. Uh, a crypt file, so you make the name of the company that you're looking at, um, uh, maybe the location is at, then previously cracked passwords, and then a smallish dictionary, and no rules. So, I mean, the, the difference between the, 
the speed of these two things is about six orders of magnitude, about a factor of a million, which is, you know, obviously very substantial. Um, so, in any password cracker scenario, you're trying to ba balance two competing aims. Red team want an answer as quickly as possible. So, and in red team, you might get your hashes from, um, you know, running, responding, faking the, um, uh, you know, the local proxy and saying, please authenticate to me. Um, you can do things like curve roasting, internal monologue. You can physically steal devices. You can steal files which are encrypted. Uh, you can try to use sort of SMB URI leakage to get a hash. Um, if you're on the system, you can you can dump the local registry hives and get the NTM that way. You might find um, network conflicts around, um, and then there might be um, uh, office docs, zip files, things like that. Um, so obviously, office docs don't initially give you a hash, but they they imply a hash because um, of the way the thing is encrypted. And it's quite nice because once you have a hash, you're not going to notify anyone by cracking it. I mean, pe people can notice a lot of things on the writing exercise, but they won't notice you cracking the hash offline. So it's quite nice from that point of view. Um, so if you, s if, you know, if you find a weird document, you can just download it, crack it, and then you can reuse that password on other things. Um, so just to give you an idea, this is a, a log base 10 um, graph of of various cracking speeds, so you can see NTLM, uh, LM, Domain Cache Credential version 1 and NetLM version 1 are all really, really quick. Uh, if you've got anything which is sort of a normal 8, 9 character password, it's it's going to break. Um, NetLM 2 and DCC 2 got slightly better. Uh, they're still not wonderful. And then Microsoft have, have actually started doing things quite well with Office. So 2013 onwards, where it's um, it's much much harder. Um, so yeah, because I got bored of of writing the same things over and over again, uh, you can if you if you've done anti DSU tool, dump it everything, you can just zip it up, feed it to this thing, put it on secret dump for you, and start cracking stuff. Um, like as you respond, you got DB or uh, you know Excel or or Word doc file, it will go oh yeah that's Excel. And it will go on the, on the appropriate converter and um, and do it for you. So that's that's an example <coughs> test case I've got where you invert the doc, uh, it works out that it it's not text. Then it will go and run the um, script from John the Ripper, Office to John dot which will give you a, a hash that Hashcat will work with, and then you'll invoke Hashcat with. The you can see the, the dash M9600. I don't need to remember that every time. Um, so it'll do a, re a reasonably sensible job for you. As I say, the idea is that I do not need to think about this every time I learn something. Um, so if you're, um, if you're sort of blue team auditing your domain, you can export the domain password, crack the hashes, and um, so if you, if you plot the graph, you can work out roughly how strong the passwords are, or at least how likely they are to get broken. Um, so basically anything under eight characters is probably going to get broken unless you've got weird sort of, you know, things that are not representable on a, on a normal keyboard. Um, and if you find it's really broken in areas, you can go and look at, you know, where they are. You can update your password policy to try to get rid of those, and then you can either age out everyone's passwords if you are making a broad policy change or you can just go and change particular users' passwords. So essentially we're, we're trying to get rid of the, the very weak passwords at this point. Um, it will also do things like handle Oracle hashes for you. So Oracle have three different types depending on the age of the system, um, S, T and H for some reason. If you feel that the D uh, you know, just the dump of the table, it will go and decode it and run the appropriate types for you. Um, so, uh, as sort of blue team defenders, what you want to do is stop people using really weak passwords. 
um, you know, something using passwords which are compromised. So that's for credential stuffing. If if something's been compromised in a dump and it corresponds to an email address, you don't want someone to be able to just look that up and then try it. And um, you want to get rid of passwords based on dictionary words or indeed keyboard patterns. Um, you also want to rate limit the speed at which people can guess passwords. So that's on a web app. Um, you just need to stop that happening either by locking accounts out for a short time or um, you can back off to a capture if people start doing what looks like brute forcing. Um, and I certainly believe people should be cracking their own password hashes to make sure there's nothing um, absolutely ridiculous. The default Windows rules are fairly poor because password run with capital P passes most people's and that's obviously not a good password. Uh, likewise, you know, summer 2019 is not a good password. Um, so, I can just say, I cracked the 500 million or so of those passwords um, because, in general, they're not very good. Um, you can see the range starting from about six characters up to maybe 16, um, with most people clustered around eight, eight or nine. Um, I have plotted the entropy. I'm not sure that means very much. It's not a very good measure of password complexity. So, obviously, if you, if you found a dictionary word with a lot of different letters in it, it would have a very good entropy. But because it's a dictionary word, it wouldn't be a uh, particularly good password. Um, you can also query the list of um, the, the have I been owned list directly. So, you can say, I've got this hash or password. Has someone found this? And it'll say yes or no. Um, there is a more anonymous way of doing it without translating the whole hash, um, and, and you might want to look at that, but that is probably quite useful for some people doing their apps. Um, the other thing you can do from password tests is you can see how, essentially how weak some of your passwords are. So uh, this is a graph of how many passwords were covered over time. You can see the VX axis is time and how many passwords is the, the y-axis. So essentially, you want to curve with not very much on the left-hand side. Um, those are passwords that are found really quickly, and possibly some of them would be guessable with an online attack. So that's an attempt at the, say, the first million from Have I Been Owned. Um, and you can see a lot of the short passwords fall very, very quickly within, um, so it takes us 10 seconds. So, you know, within a couple of minutes, you've got, uh, you've got a lot of passwords. Um, now, in this scenario, it's only a problem if your password database is compromised, but sadly, that is a fairly common occurrence. Um, maybe not so much on domains, but certainly on uh, web websites. Um, so I did a few different cracking lines to see, you know, different different attack profiles to see what would what would get most passwords quickest. Um, so on the left you've got the, the default run with the sort of top, say, 32 million passwords, and you can see which it, which is in a frequency where you can see it cracks a lot of passwords very quickly and then sort of tails off a bit. The right hand side. It's with a, using a pop file which is, contains passwords already, so you can see it starts um, already with quite a lot of passwords in it. Um, and then about the, the, the using a good card, which is a, um, a 1080 Ti. So that's with, you can see a run with the top 258 million, that curves off gradually, and then the incremental phase kicks in, and that suddenly goes up quite quick. And I think it levels off when it gets to nine characters. Um, so, so you can use these graphs to, to tune your cracking approach um, and see what's working best, but equally, if you keep the password cracking approach the same, you can tell what, you know, if, if your sort of password population has improved its sort of relative fitness, i.e. you want to get rid of the, the really poor ones. So if you keep the password cracking approach the same and do this year on year, um, you should be able to tell if things are improving or not. And pointing, of course, to keep the hardware the same as well. Um, this is probably not so relevant. Um, 
you, you can do this on anything from a laptop upwards. Um, the important thing is your laptop is not to let them overheat. They, they don't like it at all, especially if you're building CPU and GPU at the same time, uh, you can leave those problems. I use a, a 10 quid Santa Amazon, which just literally blows cold air under the bottom of the machine, and that seems to keep everything relatively okay. Um, what I've been doing most testing on is uh, a single 1080 Ti, which is quite a decent card, and, uh, and a laptop. Um, so because I'm quite often stuck at machines, and I only have a laptop, um, and then, yeah, which sometimes I, I can uh, actually put it on a decent rig. Um, so if you want to get to go, um, you can download the password list in NTRNI shell format, which is so that's quite quick. Um, some of the complexity is you need to uh, split it up because it won't all fit in one graphics card. Um, so here I split it into a about 50, 50 or 60 million passwords a day will fit. Um, so I split it into 10 different or 12, I think, different things. And then you attack each one on, on its own. Um, then you can really mer merge, resplit, and, and carry on like that. So that is um, slightly uneven complexity. Do not typo it and put n dash dash l splits it into sections of 50 million, dash n splits it into 50 million files. Most of our systems don't like it. Um, so the attack types you can do um, dictionary rules. Um, incremental with the, the default mask, you can specify mask files which are slightly more complex. Um, you can specify a dictionary and then a mask on the left or the right. Um, and so you can specify dash A1 which will um, sort of effectively zip two files together. So you can see you've got the grid there with the, the combination of all those words in them. Um, if you're running it by hand, loopback will take stuff you found and feed it back into another one. Um, dash O will optimize the run, so it'll effectively so you, you can only find passwords up to length 20. But in general, that's more than you want anyway. Um, W's work factor, so uh, W3 for Windows, because W4 will end the system when responsive. Um, which then just tells it how hard to work. Um, you can also run with a standard input, so it's what happens that the rules you can use don't allow you to do, you know, if, you, if you're changing, say, E to 3 in a sort of loop to manner, the rules only allow you to do that all at once, or not at all. Um, so, for example, I've got a Python script to do one E at a time, so, um, that will work fine. Uh, there are other statistical tools like Omen, where you, if you've got a decent IE representative word list, you can say, build me a model of this, and then the second step is start generating stuff based on that model. Um, so that can help you find some things. It's, it's something to try when you run out of other options, maybe. Um, some of the hashtag users will, will essentially uh, sort of combinate it as something very similar to the AO mode. Combination three does three lists. So we've done it here and we've got something where essentially it's got, got more like a cubic matrix of things. So it's popped out quite a hard password that you wouldn't have got through, you know, other means. So with with common H3 and dictionary words, I just found on Unix. Um, you get things like the word Pelican123, which probably you wouldn't have got otherwise. Um, if you try it with top 1k passwords, you get things like, you know, Sunshine Love Park, um, which again, you probably wouldn't have got using other methods. But the other methods are much more effective initially, so you don't want to get into this stuff until you've, you know, exhausted other options. Um, for people trying to do stuff with, say, umlauts or, you know, non-7-bit ASCII, 
it gets a bit more complicated and depends on what sort of hash you're attacking. So enter then uses sort of two bytes to represent a letter. <coughs> um, and then MD4 is it. So there's an example uh, there's an example web page which tells you how to, you know, for example, to look for umlauts. Um, and then very much depends on what code page you're running. And then when you get onto the sort of Unix hashes, it's it's much more UTF-8. In either case, you're going to need a good word list which has those sorts of things in it. Um, because what NTM is wide char, i.e. two bytes, it's, it gets very, very hard to search for all the stuff if you're using the raw underlying representation. Um, so that was all really complicated. I wrote this tool because I didn't want to do all that complexity and therefore you can just give it some fairly straightforward options. And if you don't give it the options, it'll have a decent go of it anyway. So you can give it a dictionary and rules. If you don't, it'll pick some. Um, you can give it a mask, either a mask file or a literal. Um, you can give it a dictionary and a left mask or a dictionary and a right mask or two dictionaries, which is the other one mode. Um, anyway, so I had to go at this. I uh, tried various options which are, which are there. Um, the defaults would be the dictionary mode, then the incremental mode, and gradually we got it down to something sort of workable. Um, so I guess the, the takeaway is that I've, that was all about two weeks on the laptop. So it wasn't too hard, and that proves that A, the passwords were not very good, and B, NTM is a pretty rubbish hash. So, sorry. That's probably not very helpful on its own. Um, it's certainly not a good dictionary to use because a lot of those things will not appear. If you if you try to crack your own passwords, <coughs> you probably won't have anything under seven characters. So you might as well just get rid of all that stuff. Um, likewise, if you set up a, a crack yourself, you probably use incremental mode to do those up to eight characters, and therefore you do not need them in your dictionary. It's, it's absolutely pointless having that sort of repetition. Um, if you do want to get rid of stuff like that, you can use a special hash cap mode, which is five nines, which just means plain text. So this will just take your dictionary and get rid of everything from the file, which meets that incremental crack. So um, I've certainly met people who say, just say oh, I've got an 18 gig dictionary, it's great. It's probably not great. It probably covers way too much stuff that you don't actually need. Um, so I guess in some slightly more positive news, I took the 2015 Crack Me If You Can context, which is, turns out to have about 10 different hash types in it. Um, you can, I'll show you the, the competition winner in, in a minute. But essentially on this, you can literally loop over all the files just run a hash crap, hash <laughs> crack, sorry. Um, give it the input file and let it go. Um, so uh, the winner's got about probably 50, 60k uh, results. By, by doing that, I'll go phoning it in attempt. We still got about 6,000 on you know much, much simpler hardware, much smaller hardware, and with a lot less effort. So. Essentially, this I, I wrote the script to try to take all the thinking out of it, and it does a reasonably good job in most instances. So that's where we are. Other, th other things I'd like to look at are you know, more metrics, um, those are the password generators. I mean, for example, that is, uh, if you put it in debug mode, you can see how many words was something used to get from the root dictionary word to, to what it actually found. Um, so that's a graph of the root dictionary word in the middle out, and each step is a rule in the chain, and then a crack is the end. Um, so that that will also help you evaluate your dictionaries. Um, that's some references which are probably don't want to get into. Um, if you need to do this stuff, there's uh, NSE v2 dialogue is very good. Um, the probabilistic passwords lists top and million obviously there in order of occurrence that people have found. So um, it starts with a very common one, which is great for you guys. Um, 
hashes.org has a list of everything that we've ever cracked. Um, I try to m sort of mystify some of the basic rule sets and also look at some of the breach compilations and compute sort of common suffixes, which can be quite useful as well. Um, so that is basically it. Um, I'm sorry, but it doesn't have a sorry. Um, it doesn't have a very coherent story. But then I found that password cracking is very bitty, and you need to try something. If you see past, you know, patterns appearing, then you need to go back and refine it. So it is very much a try something, see what it looks like, go back and try again. Um, having said that, if you're auditing, it helps to run the same audit every year because otherwise you don't know if you're improving or not. Um, so yeah, that is, that is basically it. Um, thank you. Right, so are there any questions online or offline? Out, that's a valid, that's certainly a valid reason. I, if you log into the domain controller, there's about six lines of um, command script you need to remember, or GUI or as I do. Um, I'm not aware of a GUI tool to do it, but it is safe. If, uh, if you do NTDS util, and then it's something like create, uh, you know, IFM create, it's, it's like the problem shadow yeah, copy. Um, I, I can probably find it find it now. I've had to write down a few times, but that will produce the the dump that you can take off the machine. And um, uh, actually, do you know probably Loftcrack does it? Last time I looked at Loftcrack, S semantically bought it and and killed it as they do. And but it, I think it's back now. Um, so Loftcrack is is definitely a tool that it should do it. Um, but it probably doesn't need to do this dump either with volume shadow copy if it's 2008 or the more volumes have NTDS at all. And you can take it across and decode it using unpack it. It's not the most straightforward process in the world, but when you've got it up and running, it's, it's fine. So ideally, I use MFA other than text. Uh, so I should be repeating this question, shouldn't I? Um, so the question is, how good is TFA? And I think if someone if someone really wants to get you and you have SMS TFA, they they could probably just walk into a shop and and uh, and drag their way to it. Um, Ubiquity in theory should be immune to that, as I understand it. Um, likewise, some of the you know the the, the TOTP generators like um, Google Authenticator should also be immune to that. They won't stop phishing uh, if it's the the six password because you the person then has like a thirty second window to log in once they've seen your code. But it does it does help. Even SMS means they have to want to get you personally rather than just a random phishing attack. So it it kind of helps, but I prefer the other kinds if I can. Yeah, you have one from the end of it. It's pretty random. Think to do mm. How effective is that? Mm, yeah, um, there's a big argument on, on Twitter. It's probably better than what most people do, mm. but I wouldn't do it. Because as you can see, we've got a way of combining three word lists uh, to see what happens. So I, 
since I got, I got this laptop about a month ago, and I've been very good about using password uh, programs since then. Before I wasn't, but um, yeah. Uh, I mean, if, if you pick three words from a random list, say we've got a vocabulary of fifty thousand, that's that's not a huge space. And if someone's expecting that, they can probably tune their approach to it. Having said that, it's a lot better than a password that most people will actually pick and practice. So I think that's why they're, they're going with that. And you, if you look for the, um, if you Google correct horse battery staple, you'll see similar arguments about entropy. <laughs> it's, it's probably better than average, but yeah. That's probably pretty good. So especially if you have characters which are not uh, not representable in the normal English character set, um, people do not tend to look for those so much. They they may if you run through a common list of say for example, if there's a lot of German dictionaries out there, so you may get Wiki and Um If you're using anything that's outside um, ISO eight five nine one, you're probably all right to be honest <laughs> because no one <laughs> uses that. Um, so there's, I mean, there's a particular letter in Welsh which is is not in that set, which is a doubly circumflex, and I bet that's not in main dictionaries. So I, I yeah, I I think that would help quite a lot for certainly pen tests. The problem is that you might come across a keyboard where you can't type that character in. Right, so it depends on how the password is stored. So there's, you can see there's things saying eight character passwords are dead. Well, if you been creative, you could probably use the Google Keep Password Manager to actually find out what the password is. Um, but yeah, if you're using Google Keep, they're not really dead. If you use MCRM, it's very easy to go through everything. Um, if you're using Google that's you know you get maybe ten thousand guesses a second on a on a decent system, and that's that's not good enough for an exhaustive search. So it, it depends. Generally, it's easy to remember a longer password without the complexity rules than it is to remember a short password with, you know, the, the, the complexities. So I use. Yeah, and that's the thing. Even if they're bad, they're probably better than nothing. Um, I use KeyPass. I haven't had a good look at it, but it, it seems pretty reasonable. That doesn't do storage with the cloud. The ones I've looked at that do do cloud storage claim to encrypt everything. So that uh, yeah. So it's even if you compromise the LastPass server, you couldn't get into it. Um, so yeah, substantially better than nothing. I think. Um, Mm, yeah, that's the so if someone's going to get passwords from a browser, they've already compromised my computer. At which point, they can load keystrokes, and that, that's almost game over in a way. But yeah, the password program I use for important passwords and less important stuff I store in the browser. Okay, thank you very much.